Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and run uh, to jump to the Thor. Hopefully that was the next device you had listed below. Now, well, actually, you know what? It might be easiest to just restate some stuff about synthesizers before we get into this one because it's a multi-synth multi, multi engine. Actually, let's slide down to the subtractor because it's the most simplistic of the synth engines and we can talk about the synthesis properties, kind of what we're looking at, what we're looking for. Um, so uh, synthesizers, synthesizers essentially have, synthesizers have uh, a unique design. Like to make a synthesizer, they're required engine elements, okay? So a synthesizer requires, and I'll kind of point to them as we as I talk about them. The synthesizer requires an engine for sound, a sound generator. And synthesizers um, typically utilize oscillators as their sound generator. There are a couple of different variations of how, you know, um, different synthesizers that'll do different types of things. But in subtractive synthesis, which is what this is, um, uh, the, the idea is to take an oscillator that makes a pure sound, um, and, the, and it, could, it doesn't have to be a sine wave, it could be different wave type forms, which is what you kind of see here, square waves, the different things. So don't the oscillator just change the tone of the sound? Yeah, so basically, yeah, the oscillator is the generator of the sound. Right, so. So it's like the, it's like the pure form of the sound, and you can shift which, which octave it is, which by playing particular notes, you're playing a different frequency of that sound. But in its purest form by itself, it's very basic and it doesn't really have much going on. The other devices are then, though, going to all the other elements that kind of center around the synthesizer are all designed to manipulate or mod the original oscillator. And they're the elements that change the initial oscillator sound. So kind of what they did with this is the basic principles are you need an oscillator, you need some sort of filter. And, and you can see this, there's a filter here. The filter could be any type of filter, really a, 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 just a standard notch uh, kind of filter, or it could be a band pass or a high pass or a low pass. So it's just gonna filter out certain frequencies. So it's isolating the frequency use. Um, and then in addition to that, um, you have the LFO, which is very common. And it's a low frequency oscillator that is not heard. It's an oscillator that's not audible but the effects of the filter that it's using uh, are audible. And that's where you get that warble sound. That's where you get that kind of sound. Uh, and essentially, it's, it's applying its own particular frequency upon the audible oscillator. So it, it only has an LFO? Well, no. I mean, it just that's just one of the LFO. That's just one of the properties. So, so it has a filter, the oscillator, the filter, the LFO. A lot of them then have some sort of um, uh, uh, noise generator. Um, sometimes uh, it might be a drive component. Something that kind of gives it a little more grit. Why wouldn't they make a HFO? Is there a reason why it's just a low frequency and not a high frequency? Yeah, the, well, the LFO doesn't affect only the low frequencies. The LFO is just it, basically the way that it's designed is the LFO is an oscillator that's put so low in the frequency band that it's not audible, but the effects can be heard when it's placed upon the oscillator. So it actually does affect all frequencies. Um, and, uh, and then in this one, there's a couple of different LFOs. Uh, the noise generator, and then, then what you'll see is a lot of times they'll have an amp. The amp will handle some sort of uh, drive, the drive components, a little more of, of what's going on with the output, kind of more of that kind of feel. A lot of times it's also tied into near the mixer, if there's some sort of mixer uh, requirement. And then there's something called a mod envelope. And then the, the mod envelope essentially is, and anytime you're looking at the envelope stage, um, a, ADSR, attack, the case, sustain, and release. Uh, are all called envelopes. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll build all these envelopes that are attached to any of the devices that, that modulate the oscillator. So the oscillator itself has an envelope selector and that's what you're doing when you change the waveform type. So the waveform type you choose is actually an ADSR type. But then when you add a filter, you're able to add a, an envelope to the filter. Essentially it's just a timing mechanism to the filter. When you add the LFO, you have a timing mechanism to the LFO. 
um, more than just the rate of the speed of the LFO, but when is the LFO applied? How is it applied? How does it decay? And then on top of that, you have uh, an additional mod envelope. And the mod envelope will, will add, again, another level of modulation to anything that's selected. On this device, you could select the oscillator 1, oscillator 2. You could use the mix component. And the mix, essentially, is just uh, the overall blend between the two. Um, there's also so, uh, something uh, in addition to, and this one's just a simple one knob, it's a frequency modulation. Um, so it's additional modulation on top of the frequency that's selected for the oscillator. And what's really interesting about this is, so you take the filter and the LFO and the noise, the amp, and then all those, the mod envelopes and all the other envelopes that are attached to different devices. So like the filter envelopes attached to the filter. Amp envelope is attached to the, the mix uh, engine. Add all that stuff together and then introduce a second oscillator. You know what I mean? And, and so like in synthesis, a lot of times they have more than one oscillator because as soon as you, you did that whole chain of variables, which essentially gives you just millions of combinations already, you add one extra oscillator it dynamically, it just it, it exponentially changes the amount of sounds and the sounds that are used. Then add a third or a fourth, some devices will have a handful of oscillators just stacked to be able to give you all that. And then they'll add, you know, filter one, filter two, mod one, mod two, LFO one, LFO two. So essentially it's just expounding upon all these ideas. Um, you know, so we're taking that pure form and we're affecting it or modulating it. Now, remember though that on the onset, the beginning sound source of a synthesizer is the oscillator. And particularly for subtractive synthesizers, because we're going to talk about um, grain table synthesis or wave table synthesis in a sec. And so, like, essentially, the reason I'm bringing all this up now, before I got to the Thor, is because some of the components you see here are going to be identical to all the other synthesizers you see. They're just going to be expounded with maybe additional ideas or concepts or, or, or abilities. You know, so, you know, a, a basic. The basic subtractor, which I don't remember if I reset it or not. Oh yeah, it's fine. Okay. You know, so this one starts off with this bass guitar patch, but but what gets us the bass guitar sound is kind of the blending of the tones and and doing some specific stuff to the ADSR. Now, um, I could go in and just say, all right, well, you know, um, let me initialize the patch. I'm going to right click this and just um, reset the device. So this is the device with, without all of the active ingredients, essentially. So as soon as I change the waveform, I'm changing the initial ADSR. Let's say I go start with a simple uh, sine wave. Because the ADSR has the attack kind of slow, that's why it feels so rounded. It's like very rounded kind of tone. I'm gonna go up the octave. Now over here I get to select different octave choices. And if I add in oscillator two, let's just say for oscillator two I still keep sine wave. And I add in oscillator two. And I have my mixed value straight up and down, which means it's gonna be blended between the two. And then instead of doing the octave up, or the octave that I'm on, I'm going to take it an octave down. Now essentially I stack both, and it just thickens the sound. And what if instead I keep the same octave, and I just start detuning my second oscillator. Well, what if instead of doing it that way, I do it by sense? What does it sound like? Like, uh, yeah, it really thickened it up. Now I don't have to be that far off. Say I tighten it up a little. Now it's not super noticeable that they're detuned anymore. It still moves a little. It's kind of got this electric piano kind of feel. So the scent, the scent essentially is. No, not the scent, the semi. Yeah, well, this is what happens. So the scent is the fine, the fine-tuned tuning adjustment. Mm -hmm. The semi is essentially that the the actual half steps between 
between them. So like you could go, um, like let's say I went back to zero on this. As soon as I take this up, this it's that note plus a half step up. If I take it two steps up, it's a, it's a full step up. If I wanted to make like a, a chord with it, like a triad, right? Yeah, so essentially the semi essentially is basically half steps. And then the scent is just the fine-tuned pitch. And then there's the octave, which is the full joke. Very beneficial though, because you, you see you hear that difference when you start thickening it out. Now if I change the waveform type, right, it really starts to stack up. And then there's a phase thing here. So if I go back, let's say I go back go back to zero there's a phase shift option here for both of these where if like notice you kind of see the sine wave shape if I were to shift them by degrees of phase you'll start to hear them shift as well and then there's a phase option here phase mode Essentially, all it's doing is it's it's going to shift the wave starting point so that they're slightly out, and then the this phase is like a phase flip or phase neutralization, uh, and then of course there's that mix. Now this is the standard frequency modulation. The control, there's really, uh, the way that this one's set up, this frequency modulation essentially is how much modulation is put in, we can attach an ADSR envelope to it by going down here and saying that this envelope's attached to FM. So let's say, hear the sound that, that changed to? This is with it, this is without it, this is with it. Now if I attach the envelope to it and I say, all right, let's take a while for the attack to take place. I'm sorry. There it goes. So instead of going there right away, it has this a bit, a bit of time that has to take a transition. Where in this one, does it right away. Here I kind of go, yeah, and then we could sustain it. You know, and that's kind of how the mod the mod works. This button here is a mod inversion, so if, basically this just flips it so it's upside down. Whatever the components are that we put there. But yeah, I kind of have to choose a destination to apply source. There's also a ring modulation here, and it's kind of fixed. It's just an active on or off. And then we get into the filter. So I'm going to get rid of the frequency, the frequency mod. So kind of the, this filter option here really kind of opens it up. Now, there's an envelope attached to the filter. As soon as you turn the amount up, it starts to be active. So if you want your filter to take its time. Oh, wait, okay. So the modulation has its own envelope, right? Yep. And the filter also, and the amp. Yep. Yep, so they all have their own ADSR option here. So that they're not. Uh, 
Oh yeah, let me get to the Yeah, that's Mod this modulation envelope can be attached to any of these devices. Gotcha. But this filter envelope is only attached to filter one. As well as the amp also, right? Yeah, the well the, the way this works out is the filter envelope is attached to the filter. Yeah. The amp envelope is is specifically attached to the mix. Gotcha. All right, so the, and the, it should actually include typically it includes the noise. But yeah, so that amp envelope is, is kind of set, even though it's over here, it's set apart to itself for the amp on the output. So you, this is like a last stop, gotcha. like a last stop envelope before it heads to the output. And I stopped playing it. Um, and that's the release, yeah, the release is set long. Sorry, hold on, let me get that fixed then. Let's pull that out. All right. So in addition to this, of course, um, we can have additional filters. We could activate a second filter here. We can link these so that it goes from filter one to filter two. Otherwise, what happens is filter one and filter two, um, if, they, if they're not set up to link, what it will do is filter two will only be applied to oscillator two. Sometimes you just have to read the manual for the how the routing is set up. There's a little bit of noise here. We could change the amount and the color. And then there, here's our LFO. We turn up the amount, we'll get the rate. And if we want to have it hard step, what we need to do is change the waveform. Now, what's important about this, more than just the rate, is who it's assigned to, where it says destination. We just, if we assign it to some of these, like right now it's the filter frequency, now it's the FM, the phase, or mix, and that mix one is where you get that. Now it's a little snappy because of the waveform type. Now there's an LFO2 you can also activate. So you could add one more LFO to this whole thing. Okay, so let's see. So oscillator two. I'm gonna change the amount. It's not or sorry, LFO two. It's not active until the amount's pulled up. And then again, I can reassign this to somebody else. Okay. 
I flipped, I inverted the filter envelope. So it's going the other way. Yeah. So it's going the other way. I was trying to figure out if I could make it smoother instead of being so snappy. You can flip the filter and the modulation? Yep. Now, in addition to this, a lot of times on these oscillators, you're going to see performance controls, and that's what these velocity elements speak to. These are performance controls, as well as this pitch bend options over here in the aftertouch, this whole section here. These are all performance controls, and in the performance controls, we almost always see something called portamento. You remember what that was? The glide rate, essentially. So from one note to the next. And then the re-trigger, do you remember Legato versus re-trigger? The difference is, is if I play notes connected to each other, like if I play, if I hit one key and then I don't let go, but I hit the next key, in Legato form, these ADSR envelopes don't restart the ADSR. They, they stay where they are in the process. So if in the envelope, when I hit the second key, it was at the sustain element, it's going to stay in the sustain element. If I do the re-trigger, every time I hit a new key, it's going to go back to the beginning of the envelope. Okay. So in re-trigger mode, or I'm sorry, in legato mode, this is me adding a note. It's just following. I'll turn this one off for a second. But in re-trigger mode, this is me adding another note. So it always like starts from the beginning essentially. Now in the velocity section, it's really interesting how the velocity section works out. Did you guys talk about that much? You're going to see velocity performance controls on a lot of these devices. Essentially, well, let's just say this. Velocity parameters on, on your controllers differ. Like a lot of the older controllers don't have as many velocity parameters when they were just like the, the new, uh, sorry, the first generation of controller. But old school MIDI keyboards, like this, this MIDI piano has been around since like the 90s, they have really good velocity control, especially the more expensive they are. And that's basically... Yeah, the pressure applied. Yeah, the pressure applied. So the velocity essentially is the pressure applied to the keys as you play them. And these velocity controls essentially, well, what, what they'll do is, is notice that there's one for the amp and the FM and the mod envelope, the phase, frequency two, the frequency envelope. You see the list there across the mix, you know, uh, and the attack. Um, essentially what happens is, is uh, um, if you set those plus or minus, what it's going to say is if, like, let's say we put it plus, it's going to say the heart, when you hit it hard, it activates frequency modulation. You play it normally, frequency modulation doesn't play. So let's say we do, actually, let's say we set them all. I'm going to set them all so that everybody's up. And I'm going to leave, let's see, I'll leave the amp down to normal. So the amp's down at normal right now. You hear it, right? So that might be beyond the ability of the... Oh, there we go. So this is everybody else. When I hit it like this, it's just the amp. So what I can do with these is I can go one way with one group and one way with another. So I can say, hey, you know what? Let's go these guys. Let's see who... All right, so play it soft, play it hard, play it soft, play it hard. And the reason it's done that way is so that, like, you can add variables to how not just 
when you play it it's softer loud but it actually reacts in certain ways you know remembering that a synthesizer in its purest design was before sampling engines existed so they were just trying to create synthetic ways to make things sound like other instruments so what they would do is they'd say all right we want to make it sound like a trumpet we need the the waveform frequencies and the things that we would usually see from a tone standpoint that would involve a trumpet we also need for the envelopes to react the way a trumpet would and then from a velocity standpoint a trumpet the bell rings when you play it loud so it has this extra noisy v uh, vibration it's kind of you know a little bit brash versus when it's soft it's nice and smooth and a little more mellow and maybe the tone has a little more filter to it when it's like that so when you set it up and you build it that way from a velocity standpoint you play it light and it sounds more like a light lightly played trumpet you play it hard it sounds like a a more um, a, you know essentially a louder played instrument so and that's how they're designed so you see, you'll see all of these uh, uh, items are almost always included in, in any oscillator or uh, synthesizer that you see so a lot of these are the key components to the oscillator or the oh gosh the synthesizer when we move on to the next synth, actually, before I move on, sorry, one thing I forgot to mention in the back panel, because this will be good to know now, because it, it, again, it directly uh, ties into what you're going to see soon um, as they become more advanced. So all these guys, um, all of these except for this one, notice this this main output is a little larger than the other ones. I don't know if you can see it on screen when you look at the back. It's just a little that. Uh, larger than these you know uh, essentially this one represents a quarter inch jack but these CVs record uh, essentially represent the little mini TTs the same thing as the patch bay that you see in the studio and these are all for control voltage connections and control voltage essentially was before MIDI was gener was created you know before the advent of MIDI in the 80s they still had a, a, a means of communicating from one device to another not just audio sending but actual communication. It was called control voltage, and by sending voltage down the line, it would tell the receiving unit to react in a certain way. Um, so they had already kind of figured that out, and that's why all the old school oscillator or uh, synthesizers that you see are always these huge things with all these cables hanging from it. You know, um, so essentially you have to patch to you know connect and communicate some of these things. So notice there's a couple of sections here in the sequencer control. You just have the gate and the CV. Now what this represents is the gate represents the rhythm or the activation of the note. The CV represents the actual note that's played. So like if I was to attach this to another device that I wanted to play this device, other than just copying the MIDI, because you could just copy the MIDI instead, if I want to attach this to something else, the gate represents the timing of the note and the CV represents uh, the, the pitch of the note. That makes sense. That's the control voltage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, even though this one says CV, these are all CV connections. Right. Now, from okay, so that's just the sequencer, just to play the play the way it is. In addition to that, though, all of your modulation input uh, inputs that you see here can be affected by external devices. So let's say modulation uh, for the filter frequency one. Notice filter frequency one as it stands is set up to these to these settings and it uses this envelope but if I attach a filter frequency one from a different device what would happen is essentially I would I would lose the control of this and it would be overridden by whatever's being sent here which means essentially like let's just say just for simplicity's sake I go and create um, let me create another subtractor if in my original subtractor I steal and that's what these modulation outputs are so these are all mod inputs and then there's only a select few mod outputs that you can send. So you can send the envelopes from these other devices. But I'm going to take my filter envelope from this device and attach it to my filter one frequency, which means the envelope you see down here now controls this filter. Yeah. And and I don't have to play this. All I have to do is play the original one. Uh, let's see. Where did it go, though? This one. Mm 
So there's that's modulation output to, to input. And then there's a volume amount to how, how much is actually applied. And I could technically take, now what's interesting is I can mix match these. So notice I could take the LFO and send it to the fr filter frequency. And then just come down here and set this. Oh, except I have to, sorry. Oops. Let me reset these because it's playing differently at different velocity. So, yeah. 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 I mean, essentially, it's, it's you know, and the output of this device still stays the way that it is. It's just sharing it. Now, the reason that becomes beneficial, because most people are like, well, I don't understand why that would be beneficial now in the modern day because it made sense then but now we can just cue everything with midi huge benefit with this is is if you're looking at it going oh the filters and the timing that i built for this one device would be cool to share amongst some of my other devices so they all move together and they all do the same rhythmic stuff you can technically there's a device that'll split this information and essentially you know multiply it so that you can cable up, you know, a bunch of different devices, so that they all react in the same way, and and then, you know, one of the other things here is this LFO amount. I don't know if we can get it to do it. If we took the, Let's see how we could do this. Let's see if we can get it to, to do this. I don't know if I'm gonna do the director, if I'm gonna have to build it into something. Else. And put it to the comp. And put it to the comp. Now what it's doing is it's just rolling the rate of this LFO. Sorry, I turned down a little. Yeah, it's just the speed, yeah. So let's say I switch this back over to just the kick. Turn the noise off. Oh wait, that's right, I have it as a snare. Uh, let's see, what did I have this in for? I can go back to it. Let's say I just pull it over here to see if this works. Let's see what else we can put in here. Oh, I can't. It's the wrong way. Oh, that's output. So. Now, usually the way that this works out in terms of the output like this this is only modulation output so it doesn't actually have in the output it doesn't have a standard cv uh output some of these other devices have standard cv outputs so you know even though this isn't i mean this isn't the greatest example of it right here um because it's like a constant it's doing the, a constant rate uh i think we can get it to let's see Filter envelope. Oh, 
Oh, that's how we would do it. You know what? That's more realistic. It'd be more realistic to do this. So, so let's see if we can get it to do it. Um, LFO. To modulation input volume. Actually, you know what? Let's do it on the redrum if we have one. Pitch CV, gate in. Oh, you know what? This one doesn't have a volume CV on it, but it should have a volume CV in the programmer. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so this is, this is it. This is something that's done actually quite a bit. What I'm about to show you here, uh, I'm going to put this LFO CV rate to on the mix block of the redrum kit. I'm going to put this on the volume level CVN. This is what it should do. When I push play, now what it's doing is it's doing a volume breakdown. And watch what happens. What it's doing is it's going to take the LFO and only do it to the volume level. So a lot of times in like electronic music now, they do this a lot where it's like kind of breaking up and it punches on the beat. And we could also do it in the panner. And if you were sitting between these, it's just going back and forth. You know, there's a couple of ways we, uh, different ways we can add that. But yeah, this is real popular. I don't think there's any other output for this one, but. You know, it's also used a lot. Let's see if we can get it to go in the gate out. Oh, no, wait, this is the same device. No, I can't get it to use there. Uh, you know what? I'll have another device option and I can show this to you. You know, we'll get there because there's more to that, really, to that story. But there's the, there's there's your... Uh, your basic uh, synthesizer along with its outputs. I'm gonna tab over. So this is where it gets kind of interesting. So what they did with synthesizers is they took what they called additive and subtractive synths. Subtractive synths started with an oscillator and then you basically deteriorate the oscillation. In additive synthesis, you start with an oscillator and then you kind of multiply the oscillators as you go and by adding and stacking all these different oscillators, you really start to create these sounds. In um, what we call wavetable or granular synthesis, which is what the Maelstrom is, they basically, it's almost as if what they did is they took the final output of an oscillator that, or of a, a synthesizer, they created this synthesizer with all these great sounds, they took the output of it, and then they routed it, route that output, final output to the input of a brand new synthesizer. So it's almost like the, in the wavetable or granular synthesis, it's almost like the final point, the ending point, the goal of a normal synthesizer is the beginning starting point of granular wavetable synthesis. What it does is it actually uses a sample, where well, they call it a grain, okay? Um, they call it a grain because it's a short, real short sample. And in the short sample, that's your oscillator. And what, it, the, what they do is they give you a couple controls with it. You can adjust the pitch. You can adjust the ADSR. You can also shift the starting point of the sample. You can change the length of the sample. You can change how and what direction it gets played. So that's what you see here when you're looking at this you know, standard oscillator A. I'm going to just deactivate these guys real quick so we can see just oscillator A. Is you see initially the octave, the semi, the scent adjustments, the ADSR, the volume. And then you have the index, the shift, and the motion. So let's see. Let's start with this one and see. Actually, that's not a good one. Okay, here we go. Now, in the index, essentially, 
the index is the positioning in the sample. The shift is just a basic pitch shift. The motion is how it moves. Now you go in and you change ADSR, it really does shift things. You go in and stack another oscillator. Oh, the only downside to this, the one thing that's, that's a little bit different about this, the main output is in stereo, kind of. It's a left-right, but left and right are basically filter A, filter B outputs, which means that the way this is routed, there's a spread option, which is you know fully spread out all the way left-right, but then you only have one sound on one side and another sound on the other side. You don't have them both. You don't hear them both together. So... If you take a mono, you can hear them both, and then you kind of have a balance of somewhere in between. Oh, this is interesting. Listen to this one. Now we get to, again, adjust the position, and then the motion's kind of set to how much of the sample we hear. What they did differently with this one is, in this device, they have two, two main modulators. And in the modulators before, it was just an envelope, right? This mod envelope. And it could be assigned to certain you know, devices. In this one, it's actually, the, each mod is a waveform that gets applied. So instead of it being just an ADSR that you choose, it's way more complex than that. Because like, think about the ADSR that you see here. I mean, it's basically ADSR, ADSR, ADSR. It's like a recycling ADSR, but they're different, you know. You attach this, and then you can choose, is it going to go to A, oscillator A, oscillator B, or in between would be both. You activate it by hitting the little button here. And then you can tell it, is it going to be a one-shot mod, meaning is it only going to happen once, or is it going to continue to repeat? So this is with... And then you can still change the rate. This is one shot. Notice at the end of it, it balances back, it kind of comes back to normal. And then you can shift. Now, anytime you see anything that says, you know, that gives you a rate, that's usually, usually rate is always going to be applied in either terms of time, milliseconds, or in terms of beats upon the measure. And if there's a sync button, the sync essentially attaches it to the tempo. So that means now it's going to be a subdivision of the beat. Without sync, it's, it's just milliseconds, and it doesn't have to fit the, the rhythm of the beat. Problem with it, with it not being synced, so a lot of times it'll fall outside of the time of the tempo. So a lot of times you want to sync it, and then all of a sudden you'll see it says like a, uh, a fraction, and that's a quarter note, three sixteenths, an eighth note, right? Eighth note triplet, 32nd. Right? 
So and then you actually see those kinds of rhythmic values there. Uh, I'm gonna throw in mod B. Now, the one thing about this device, they're all kind of set up differently. You'll see there's these little arrows. And basically what these denote is the path that the audio is taking. So in oscillator A, right now, oscillator A is going to this shaper tool. It's not active. You can see the lights off. From there, it's going to filter A. And then what then the mo these modulators aren't actually part of the path per se. They are assigned to react directly to. So essentially they don't, they're not. Part of the path when they're disengaged, they're not part of the path when you engage them. They actually respond directly to the beginning of the the oscillator before it moves on, which is why they're not included as part of the path. You know, so we're going to the shaper and then filter A here. But if you follow oscillator so B, go ahead. Modulation goes to the oscillator, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. If you follow oscillator B, it goes to filter B, and then from filter B, it looks like it stops. Technically, what it does is notice it says filter filter A is here, filter B is here. On the back, it says main output, filter A, filter B. So just remember, filter A and filter B are the last stop here. Um, there is a main volume that still controls them both, but it, that's before it finalized output. But notice there's something that happens here. You can actually route, if you engage filter B, actually you don't even need to engage it, you can actually route filter B to the shaper, and if you follow the path, that means it also gets sent to filter A. Interesting, right? So, you know, you can actually have this route, you know, in a couple combinations. If we activate everybody here, uh, you can also have oscillator A. Notice it has two paths down here. You could have oscillator A go to both A and B filters. Because of this path, there's an option there and there's an option there. So, and then you can change what filter types you're using, as always. Comb filter, yeah. Now this envelope button means that it's attached. Filter B or filter A are attached to the envelope. What's up, bud? Hi, do you have a class in here at one? Uh, no, I don't. There may be a class in here at one. Okay. Is your? I'm having a problem. Are you? Time. Are you booked? I mean, like, is the other room booked? Is that why? Yeah, Dr. Thomas has 205, so I went to 213, but they have a class there at 130. Oh uh, shoot, I didn't realize any of. And I can't use this one. Why does Dr. Thomas have 205? She's got a Herbert class. Oh, they didn't put it on the schedule. They have her little set as 207. Shoot. And I can only use two rooms. I'm sorry? Hey, they actually, you might want to check 219. I actually had them drop a second, or I did it. I dropped a second line. So there's actually two cable lines back there. One of them's HDMI. I just don't know if the one that you need is VGA or DVI. Okay, I'll go check. Maybe go check it. The one on the PC in the corner. All right, so. You feeling that, right? Okay, so you know, you can basically do all those. The only additional thing that's here that you didn't really see before uh, comb filtering, which is a specific filter type. Um, there's an amplitude modulation filter uh, designed to these filters. When you activate the envelope, that's actually using this envelope and this amount, and there's an inversion button like you've seen before. Then there's the shaper tool. And essentially what this is going to do is it's going to e add any one of these options for shape on top of whatever's already listed here. So sine wave shape, saturation, clip, quantization, or noise. Oh, it's just low pass okay, yeah. and band pass, and the 12 represents 12 decibel or 12 12 dB per octave. It's the it's essentially it's the Q roll off. It's like how fast it rolls off. 12 is actually fairly slow. 24 is the one we use a lot, for like the real hard roll off. But yeah, essentially that's that's how those are used. And then over here, you go back over here, 
What's all this? Yeah, performance controls. Performance controls. And um, the only addition here is in this section is that instead of having a retrigger option, uh, it retrigger is on by default, and there's a legato. There's only a legato option, but Portamento still exists. The only thing we oh yeah, the one thing I did skip last time was pop polyphony versus monophonic. Do you remember? And it, you'll see it on all these devices. You see the polyphony number here, and there's a polyphony number here. What's the difference? What, what was poly, polyphony versus monophonic? So, okay, so monophonic, super important for you to know in synthesis, okay? Monophonic means it only plays one note at a time. Polyphony means it plays multiple notes at a time. Now, the re, the, the anytime you, well, let's just say this. This is how you decipher what, how many notes you need. At a time, okay? What kind of instrument are you trying to play? If you were trying, because remember that synthesizers are designed to sound like some sort of instrument. Now, in modern synthesis, most people don't listen to a synth and go, oh, that sounds like a trumpet. Most of the time they go, oh, it sounds like a synth. If it's just supposed to sound like a keyboarded synth, you just have to ask yourself, how is it supposed to play? Is it supposed to play with multi, like, uh, you know, a bunch of hands, a bunch of notes? Or is it really only supposed to to play with one note very well. Now, that's kind of one of the questions you have to ask yourself. And then you have to ask yourself, what kind of instrument am I trying to emulate? If you're trying to emulate like a voice, how many how many notes can a voice hit at one time? Um, yeah, you, you try singing multiple notes at a time. Yeah, it's just, I can't do it. <laughs> it's just one. Right. So that's why your polyphony would be for making a voice, it'd be one. For your polyphony for being a trumpet, it'd be one, because they only play one note at a time. Your polyphony for a bass guitar, bass guitars typically have four strings, which means the, the max amount that they could have is four. So you kind of have to ask yourself, well, what am I trying to emulate? If it's piano, it's usually somewhere between the amount of fingers you have, and then if you're holding the sustain pedal, when you switch chords, if you're playing full fingers to the next chord, so a lot of times it's like 10 or 12 is what you'd want to have. But the benefit, if you don't know, or if you're just trying to make a specific sound of making it one sometimes, is listen to what happens when it's more than one right now. Let me change it to one now. And what happens is, is, is when it's one, it forces the, the like, if you're holding one note, and you play another note, it forces the first note that you played to go away instead of sustaining underneath. I was wondering why this was happening to me when I was playing at first and it would just go away. Now, that answers the question. But it makes it kind of easy if you were like... Right, yeah. And you didn't want to have to keep playing that lower note. One thing I like about it, it, I do it a lot for strings, if I'm making string stuff with something that has a polyphony amount, is it also allows me to not accidentally overlap the notes, and, and it makes sure that it sounds accurately attacky at the front end. Um, I think that's an, all the time we have really for today uh, overall, but um, when we come back, we're gonna have to pick up where we left off. I think we're, we're almost there. But the, some of the engines that we need to talk about anyway are going to be the samplers that we're going to start to use. So what I'd like for you to do is read chapter one, um, and then you know make sure you have, if you can, get your your headphones and your uh, hard drive and all that stuff. Yeah, if you can, if you can bring it, that'd be awesome.